Good morning, subscribers, Kingdom Saints, viewers. Okay, so this morning when I woke up at 3, God gave me a message. Then I went back to sleep. And the message was, give my viewers a testimony and let them know about my life, how I came up from the uttermost to the uttermost, do you hear me? So what I decided to do was make a video and just give you a feel, a glimpse of how I came up and what happened in my life to make me change, to make me wanna find Jesus and walk with Jesus every day. So let's start when I was 10 or 11. When I was 10, I was living at home with my mother and father. Well, my stepmother. I didn't really know my mother. Actually, I didn't know her at all. Because my dad and her separated when I was three. So I didn't know her whereabouts. I, at that time, I didn't even know her name. At that time, I didn't know the even know that my stepmother wasn't my mother because I was thinking she wasn't my mother until I found out later in life that she wasn't and to this day I still don't know my mother I don't know what, uh, whether she's living or dead or whether she loved us or not but you know that's life right there so uh, when I came up my dad was really really hateful Really, really, really mean. He didn't show us any love whatsoever. And he never approved of anything that, that, I did, that I did or said. So I decided to leave home. I left home when I was 11 or 12 years old and I hit the streets, you know what I'm saying? Raised up in the streets, but I, lived, I, moved, I moved in with a black family. So I guess you could say I got blackatized when I was young. <laughs> I, I killed me. Anyway, uh, my friend's mother raised me as her own. You know what I'm saying? She raised me as her own, took care of me, took good care of me. So I'm not going to say I didn't have a mother, but I did have a mother who wasn't my mother. A mother from my never brother. <laughs> I killed me. So, coming up 11 or 12, there was nothing but big boys on my block. You know what I'm saying? They was doing big things. And I said, um, I want a piece of that. So I fell in with the wrong crowd and started doing things that uh, big boys, the big boys was doing, you know what I'm saying? I joined the gang when I was 16 or 17, you know what I'm saying? And um, I was always in trouble. If I wasn't in trouble, I was causing trouble. And there's a lot of, been a lot of uh, times in my life where I should have, I should have been dead. But to this day, now I know that it was God who saved me from all those times that I should have been dead. You know what I'm saying? I can even tell you about one time when uh, I was caught slipping. Yeah, I was by myself, but I, I had a, I had a woman on my mind at the time, and I was drinking with my buddies, and they said, "Hey, man, we're gonna roll with you." I said, "No, no, no, I want to be alone. I want to think. I want to walk and think." And I, I was thinking about her because I was in love with her, but she, she really broke my heart. Anyway, uh, I didn't know that this dude was following me. Yeah, he was following me. Cause he knew I had money and bling bling. And I was so drunk, I just looked back, I said, huh, huh, what's going on? And I was just too out of it to even respond, you know, cause normally I would have responded in a terrible way. So he got, he got me off guard, you know. We threw a little bit of a struggle, but he took this big cylinder block smashed it on my head and gave me 12, 13, I think it's 12 or 13 stitches right here. And when I woke up in the hospital, the doctor looked at me and said, why are you still alive? 
I said, huh, what are you talking about? He said, you should have bled out. That's another time that the Lord saved me. He said, anybody else would have bled out. He said, it's a, it's a miracle you're alive. And when he said miracle, I looked up and I said, yes, miracle. It is a miracle. That's when I started realizing that there is a creator, that there is a God who's looking after me. But I was too rebellious, I was too stubborn, I just kept on going, kept on going, doing what the evil one wanted me to do, you know what I'm saying? So, okay, I was about 20 when I decided to join the, uh, join the job corps, because high school wasn't working. High school was not working. I was getting into too much trouble. You know what? I've been to one, two, three, four different high schools in D.C. They transferred me from one to two to three to four. And then it got to the point where I said, I'm tired of this. You know what I'm saying? I just said, I'm going to make my own way. But my way was not the right way. Your way was the right way. But I didn't know it at the time. So anyway... I said, you know what, I need to get off these streets because there was always something pulling at me saying, get off the streets. That was the Lord telling me, choosing my path. But I didn't know it at the time. That was the Lord telling me, to, uh, guiding me. So I joined the Job Corps, Potomac Job Corps. I joined the Job Corps there. Got into more trouble over there. Because it was like, it was like the street, basically. It was like school, basically. You know what I'm saying? I got into more trouble. Uh, I cut a hole in the fence. <laughs> At Potomac Job Corps, I cut a hole in the fence. Because Potomac Job Corps is right next to, uh, what's it called? What's that place called? Eastover. So I cut a hole in the fence. I said, come on. Me and, my, me and my buddies. I had a crew when I was in job corps. Yeah, I had my own crew. Everywhere I went, I had a crew. I had my own crew. And I was the leader of this crew. And um, cut a hole in the fence. And we we walked over to East over to the liquor store. And we had resident advisors at that time. You know, resident advisors in every dorm. We had resident. And the resident advisor said, yeah, I can go ahead. He was supposed to stop us and and, t and and report us, but he said, y'all can go ahead, just bring me some beer back. And we gave him a little money under the table. He let it, we, we brought him some beer back. Man, we had like four or five cases of beer, feel me? And we were just getting drunk right in the dorm in Job Corps. And we'd go to class in the morning, we'd be all out of sleeping or just, some of them were, some of them was just troublemakers that would choke around in class. And, Mess with, or mess with other people. So anyway, that didn't work. They transferred me from Job Corps, from Potomac Job Corps, over to Harpers Ferry Job Corps. And I'm like, Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. I'm like, what is this? It's a all-male Job Corps. It's a all-male Job Corps. I'm like, are you serious right now? But anyway, I made it through there. I made it through there. That's how I got a chance to go to college. Cause I was, I was my uh, my trade was welding. I was halfway finished welding course. I was welding. I like welding because I don't know it pays good money. So, but this uh, representative from the from the universities came to the job court and asked people. They was asking. The, People who wanted to go to college. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll take college. But, uh, unfortunately, I went to college and only did two years because I ran out of money. That's a four-year degree. I was studying communications. So I had to... I didn't want to go back home. I had to leave, but I don't want to go back home. I'm like, no, not home. But I did go home to visit, and when I went home to visit... Everybody that I used to hang with, even the big boys, when, when I didn't know the big boys that was on my block, before I joined the big boys, you know what I'm saying? 
they were all dead or locked up. They were all dead or locked up. Even the ones that I was close to, that was gone. And I'm not going to visit you in prison. I ain't going to visit you in prison. I'll send you commissary. I'll write to you, but I ain't going to come to visit, prison to visit you. I'm going to wait for you to come out. You know? That's That was my philosophy back then. So anyway, that, that, that was another signal. That was like, man, I need to stay off these streets. Because there's always a side of me that knew better. You know what I'm saying? There was always a side of me that knew better. So I'm like, okay, uh, what to do next? Went back to Job Corps. No, I went back to um, my hood. And I just like, no, I was like, I can't live like this. I can't do this. I mean, I knew how, I knew ways how to make money. Matter of fact, I had money coming to me from other sources. But I was like, no, I can't, I can't do this. So I, I decided to join the service. I joined, I joined the army. No, 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 no. I joined the Marines, the United States Marine Corps with two buddies on a buddy system. And then after that, after, after training, the two buddies that I was supposed to go overseas with, they changed our MOS. And they changed our our, our so I, I I complained. I went to the adjutant general, the AG, and I complained. So what they did was they transferred transferred me to the army, to the same location where they were going, but there was in the Marines and there was an army. But that's what they did. They, I don't know. That's what they came up with. So I, I went to the Marines, finished boot camp, then from straight there I went to the army took boot camp all over again with them. And they stationed me in, after boot camp, I went to Seoul, North Korea. I was stationed at Camp Casey, 2nd Aviation Battalion. Yes, and a place called Tong Du Chong. We call it TDC. And I was getting into more trouble over there, but just fun kind of trouble, you know what I'm saying? Not really trouble, trouble. I don't mess with the MPs and the military. I don't I was doing I was doing a good job. I went from PFC to I went from yeah, PFC is corporal or specialist. When I finished I was a staff sergeant. I came out of staff sergeant. So uh, it was it was a it was a a learning experience, and from that day on, it taught me discipline, respect, obedience, and how to be a more complete man, a, a more complete man with hardly any flaws. So after that, hey, I was like, okay, I wouldn't even worry about the streets no more. You know what I'm saying? I wouldn't worry really about the streets anymore. I was doing my own thing. I was working odd jobs to make a living. Actually, that's the first time I worked is when I came out of the army. The first time I started working was when I came out of the army. How old was I? I was 22. So I was doing landscaping. I was doing uh, uh, fast food places. I was... I worked at a pizza place. I was trying to find my niche, trying to find my strength, trying to find what I was good at. What what is the kind of work that I want to do? What, what is my? There's that word I'm looking looking for. Career. I was trying to find my career. What is my career goals? What is my what is my career going to be like? And uh, I was just like working these odd jobs and whatnot. I was jumping from job to job. You know what I'm saying? Because I saw a better opportunity. I said, oh, they pay more money. I'm going for that. You know what I mean? So, anyway, I went from job to job to job until I saw a friend of mine. And he said, hey, you have a, you have a, you have a, in a courier? So, I started, I was, he introduced me to a bicycle messenger. I was a bicycle messenger, man. I was like a bicycle messenger for five, five, six years. You know, the pay was good. I was making like $800 a week, tax-free, on a, on a 
good week, I would make a thousand, thousand dollars a week. You know what I'm saying? But I was still dipping and dabbling, and dipping and dabbling with my, with my crew, and I was still getting into trouble. You know what I'm saying? But I would just keep it low key. You know what I'm saying? I always keep it low key. And then uh, I was a bicycle messenger. I was making good money. I was banking it and whatnot. And I got tired of that. Because I can't picture myself in my 60s or in my 40s riding a bike. I wouldn't be in shape. My legs would probably fall out. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? That's for the youngins. Youngins, box of old messers. You wanna make some, y'all youngins out there, y'all wanna make some legit money instead of being in trouble? Making money the fast way to get you a good bike. Be a bike messenger. It pays good. And it keeps you in shape. Believe me. So anyway, after that, I found my niche. I found what I loved the most. A friend of mine came to me and said, you want to do security? You want to join the security? I said, oh, security? I never even thought about that. So that was 1990. I was 30 years old when I started doing security in 1990. And I was doing this, I was doing security from 1990 to 2008. 1990 to 2008. That's, um, that's 18 years. But it could have been to 2010, 18 to 20 years. And I worked at sites where you had to stand for 16 hours. I worked at sites where it was like prison cells prison. You know what I'm saying? I worked at sites it was uh, public housing. I worked at every public housing site in D.C. You know what I'm saying? So some quarter, Nally, Helen Bowles, Barry Farms, Potomac Gardens, Greenleaf. I worked at all of them. Trinidad, Northeast. I worked at all of them. But uh, I got respect because in order to get respect, you gotta give respect. I respected all of them. I respected everybody, the drug dealers. I mean, they they respected me so much that when they see me walking up the f- or making rounds on the floors, they're shooting dice and drinking. They leave. They leave because they know they respected me. They know I'm not, I'm not gonna tell them to leave there, but I didn't have to tell them because we had respect for each other. You know what I'm saying? It's all how you talk to people. It's all how you treat people. So anyway, after that, uh, after that, that was 2010. I, I met my kid's mother in 2000. No, wait, I met my kid's mother in 19, 1990, three years after I started doing security. I met my kid's mother three years. So, uh, in 2006, she died of breast cancer. She died in my arms. She grabbed my arms. And, Cause her, her pain was so bad that she would wake up in the morning, two in the morning, one in the morning, and then again at two, and she would be crying out in pain and crying and crying out in pain. I said, okay, that's it. I called the ambulance and they took her to the hospital. I was out was with them. And she grabbed my arm at the hospital and said, Lewis, I don't want to die. And I was holding her and said, you're not going to die. You're not going to die. Ten seconds later, she died while I was holding her. She died in my arms. That was the saddest day of my life. That was the saddest day of my life. Because she was everything to me. The only, the first and the only woman that I ever loved. She was everything to me. That's when my life was started going downhill. 
That's when my life started going downhill. I tried to commit suicide two times. I almost drowned at Six Flags. So an angel saved me. That's one, two, three. A guy hit me over the head with a nine millimeter and left a gas right there. That's four, four times I should have been dead. The guy that hit me with the cylinder block. Five times I should have been dead. Five times I should have been dead. A guy tried to rob me when I had my bling bling on. And he saw my bag, my colors. I saw him load the gun. He pulled the trigger. And it went click, click. And I heard a voice say, run. That was the Holy Spirit. The voice said, run. And I ran and I ran. That's six times I should have been dead. Six times I should have been dead. And even though I had what I wanted when I was coming up, even though I had what most teens my age would dream of having, I had it all. That includes women, that includes finances, that I still felt something that was missing in my life, in my heart. My heart felt empty. I had everything I wanted, but I still felt empty. You know what that emptiness was? You know what was a missing piece of my heart? Jesus. Jesus was the missing piece. He was the missing piece. And I'm so glad I found him. Or he found me when I was 48 years old. That's why I say it's never too late. It is never too late. You know what I'm saying? So after my ex died, after my kid's mother died, we was never married, but it's common law marriage. You know what I'm saying? In D.C., if you live with somebody for six years, common law. If you have a relationship and you live with them for six years, common law marriage. That's the law here. I don't know about any other states, but in D.C. it's six years. Um, After that, Oh man, I was just drifting back and forth. I went back to my crew, I went back to my gang, I mean. And uh, in 2010, in 2010, I came to the end of myself. Literally. I came to the end of myself. I went it out of my gang, so I, I I left the gang. Didn't even tell him, didn't even ask, because I knew what they was gonna say. You know, because when you're in the gang, there's blood in and blood out. There's only one way in, you get beat down, and there's only one way out. You get killed, you get murdered. So uh, they put a green light out on me. If y'all don't know what a green light is, that's like uh, when you leave, when you want to leave a game. Shoot on sight, kill on sight, so. Okay, the two people that they sent down here to kill me, it was like individual. One came at first and then another came. And I already knew who, who this first one was because I saw him. And I said, I knew that, I knew who that guy was. He was in my old hood, Mount Pleasant, which I used to run. And I knew he was, he came down to kill me. You know what I'm saying? So um, I stayed away from him. The Holy Spirit said, walk away. So I walked away and I'm glad he didn't see me, but he was gonna kill me that day if it had seen me. That's why the Holy Spirit put me right there where I was at so I could see him. 
because the Holy Spirit sends a spy into the camps of your enemies so that you will have a way of escape. Am I right about it? And, uh, you know, I come to find out two months later, he got murdered. Mm -hmm. Is that an act of God or what? Because uh, scripture says that God will not let anyone abuse you. Anyone abuse you. Even though I wasn't selected yet. But he knew because God said, I first knew of you since before you were first formed in the womb. So, okay, I was relieved. I was relieved. So, about a month later, I was in Mount Pleasant again at Hello's Bakery. Anybody from Mount Pleasant, anybody from D.C. and that knows about Mount Pleasant and a place called Hellers Bakery knows that they're the best bakery in the D.C. area. They were the best back then. They're not there anymore. But back then I would get some apple turnovers, some, some freshly baked chocolate chip cookies, and my favorite chocolate eclairs. My mother, my stepmother would send me to the store. And every change that I get from going to the store, I would stop at that bakery and get what I wanted, get all these, these delicious goodies. And I eat it on the way home because I didn't want her to know that I spent the change. <laughs> but anyway, I saw this guy and uh, I was like, oh man, oh man. And he saw me while I was walking away. He could have just, he could have shot me in the head. He saw me. I didn't get a chance to escape this time. But he, uh, he said, hey, Yo no estoy con la con la pandilla nunca más. No, no, nunca me voy a volver porque yo había dicho he, he talked to me in Spanish. He said he's not in the gang anymore. He left too and he gave me a hug. He said he found Jesus while he was in prison. I mean, while he was locked up. He said that was a life-changing experience for him. I'm like, whoa, you found Jesus in a jail cell? Wow, okay. So we gave each other a hug, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, okay, so. That's after I got baptized and saved and went to my, went to my, started going to my church. But, uh, oh, let me talk about that. How Jesus found me. Before that, before that, these two guys with the that they sent to kill me before that. I think maybe a month before that. I was out on my front porch. And I was like, oh Lord, I'm tired of living like this. Because I really didn't want to go out and do what, what I usually do. I was tired of that lifestyle. I was tired of it. I was tired of looking over my shoulders. I was tired of the police messing with me. I was tired of getting overnight lockups. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, okay. Yeah, because most of it was for drinking in public. Drinking in public, stuff like that, misdemeanor stuff. I don't have a felony record or not like that because I always try to stay clean. So anyway, um, the first time in my life the first time in my life that I asked for Jesus, that's the first time that that name came out of my mouth, Jesus. You know what I'm saying? So I said, Jesus, help me, Lord, please, Lord. I didn't even know how to pray back then. I didn't even know nothing. About, but I guess you could call it praying. I said, Jesus, help me. Bring me out of this, Lord. I need a better life. I need a new life. I heard that you can give me eternal life with you, Lord, and a better life on this in this world, Lord. 
Remove me from everything that I put myself into, Lord. Jesus, Jesus, I need you. All of a sudden, like, mind you, it was a warm, hot, sunny day. No wind at all, but I felt the wind. And the hairs on my arms stood up and I felt the warmness that was the Holy Spirit. And I heard a voice said, walk. And I walked and I walked and I knew that wasn't my, I knew that wasn't my voice because I know what my voice sounds like. We all know what our voice sounds like, you know, when, when that voice says little bad things and stuff, you know what I'm saying? And you go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, this was the Lord's talking to me. That was God Almighty because it's a loud, thunderous voice and it made me shake. So I walked and I walked and I walked until I got to a park. I heard the voice say, stop. And I stopped and I was in front of the park where they had benches and the pavement and whatnot. So I said, oh, is this where you wanted to be stopped? Wanted me to stop? You want me to sit on a bench and pray to you? The voice said, turn around. So I did a 180. I did a 180 and there was the mighty, mighty Gethsemane. And I went to that church that following Sunday. I got saved at that church. I got baptized at that church. I accept the Holy Spirit at that church. I got filled with the goodness and the love of Jesus at that church. I made a, uh, Kingdom family, at, I had kingdom family at that church. We were all family. We, we was all in one accord at that church. You know what I'm saying? I was like, whoa. I didn't know the goodness of the Lord was going to be like this. So I was like, okay. So I went to that church. And I was going to that church for, after seven years of going to that church. I'm like, what is, what is, I just felt empty. I, I just didn't feel it anymore. I was like a, I was like a fly on the wall. Just flying around. I wasn't getting nothing out of it. I wasn't feeling the Holy Spirit anymore because I was like, okay, going to church on Sunday, is that all there's to it, being a Christian? Just going to church on Sunday and trying to stay out of trouble the rest of the week, you know, trying not to sin and going to church, trying not to sin and go to church, trying not to sin and go to church, read scriptures, read scriptures, sip the milk, eat the meat, sip the milk, eat the meat. I was eating so much of the meat, uh, that's why I'm so fat. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, Brother Marcus. My brother in Christ, Brother Marcus, I saw him at the church. I said, Brother Marcus, is this all there is to it? Going to church on Sunday and trying to stay out of sin and whatnot? He says, No, 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 no. There's more to to being a, more to this than being a Christian. These church members just don't know. So he said, Come with me. I walk with him. And he, I said, Where are we going? He said, You see, we went to Tacoma Park Metro. To, to come apart, I said, oh, you, you want me to get on the subway and go home? You, you could have drove me home. I was just kidding. Um, but actually, I did say that, but I was just joking with him. So he, we was looking at this guy leaning against the uh, the rail at the metro station, and he had gang tats. <clears throat> and he was walking with a limp. He had a limp, he was walking with a limp. <clears throat> so my <clears throat> brother Marcus approached him. I said, oh, my brother Marcus, I didn't know you was affiliated. I thought that was his homeboy. I'm just kidding. <clears throat> but I did say that. So brother Marcus asked him if he could pray for him. I said, oh. And then brother Marcus laid hands on him. I said, huh? I didn't know about that. 
So he laid hands on the on the man's knee, and the man went, ah, ah. It's like it's like when you feel something strange in your body. What? Ah, ah. But he was smiling. So after Bubba Marcus finished praying, the man started walking straight. Bubba Marcus said, "Go ahead, test your leg." The man started walking straight. I was like, "What is this?" I was like that that sorcerer in scriptures who who was in disbelief after he witnessed one of the um, prophets brought somebody back from the dead, and he offered and he offered them some shillings or whatever they called it back then to receive the Holy Spirit and Peter picked it up and threw his money back at him and said, you can't buy the Holy Spirit. Anyway, um, I was like, after I saw that, I was like, that's it. That's what I want to do. That's what God has called me to do, to go out and do outreach and lay hands on people and pray for people and, and evangelize. That's what God has called me to do. Except I didn't know what evangelizing was until, until after he took me to Baltimore to meet the Reaper Squad. And this brother, his name was Brother Trello, was on the mic. And, and they had speakers out there, and they had a table, and they was passing, the, giving out food, and they were laying hands on people. I'm like, oh, okay. This is my calling, so I joined the Reaper Squad, and Bubba Trailer was on a mic evangelizing. And so I was like, I, I want to do that, but I was inhibited. I was like, I don't know if I can do that. Plus, I didn't know the word that much. So I was just watching him, watching him. He gave me the mic and said, no, he, he said, you want to you wanna preach? I said, uh, no, uh-uh. I, I don't know what I'm doing now. So I just stood there another hour and watched them, watched him, watched everybody, you know, I'm like, Holy Spirit said, go for it. So he gave me the mic a second time. I said, yeah, I'm going for it, thank you. So I got the mic and man, oh man, oh man, oh man. Once I got on that mic and started preaching, I was like, I started out with Jesus loves you, but he hates your sin, I was like, and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just kicked in and was telling me the verses and the scriptures that I didn't even know that I knew. I'm like, ooh, because you know the Holy Spirit would give you utterance. The Holy Spirit will fulfill your wisdom. And I was like preaching out there and there was like, people was actually listening? Wow, wow. I, I felt like I was actually impacting somebody's life. I felt like I, I was actually touching somebody's soul. So Buffalo Taylor, Taylor said, okay, uh, so it's his son, give him the mic. I was like, nope, you ain't getting this mic. Uh-uh, I ain't finished yet, brother. <laughs> I just wanted to keep on going. I, I gave him the mic eventually, though. And after that, it's all been uphill with the Lord. I just went uphill, up, up, up. up. I just kept going up until my spirit just sat with God in heavenly places because scripture says all saints, all those who follow Jesus and do God's will, their spirits are seated with him in heavenly places. So I realized, you know, that that's that's my mission. And that's my that's what I wanna do. So when we came back to DC, we was going back and forth to Baltimore every Every Saturday, then it, then it was every other Saturday. And on the, on the cold days, in the winter months, we'd go to the malls, local malls, D.C., Maryland, or Virginia, go inside the malls, because people ain't out in the, in the coldness. So we'd go in the malls, lay hands on people, pray for people. And after a while, I was like, okay, I need to do that. I need to do that in D.C. I need to evangelize. And so I started, that's when I started Swag Ministries. You know, the videos that you see me in with my ministry, I started swag ministry. I started off by myself, but I learned the hard way, don't do that no more. Because 
I need somebody to wash my stuff. I need somebody to, because they're not going to do nothing to you if there's one or more. I mean, two or, two or more. Jesus said, when two or three are gathered in my name, I am in the midst. I am in the midst. But I've had my tripod knocked down. I've had GoPros broken. I've had my phone, because I used to record on my phone for Facebook. My phone was broken. One dude took my speaker and just smashed it down. I'm like, that was a $450 speaker. I'm like, okay, I ain't doing this no more. I'm going to get me a crew. So I got my own crew now. I met Sister Joan, I brought Brother Nelson, I brought Brother Dale, and a few others. You know what I'm saying? So we've been going strong ever since, you know what I'm saying? We've been going all strong ever since. And uh, I'm so glad that uh, I decided to walk with Jesus because that's that's the story of how I came up and how Jesus transformed me. And I'm... I'm not conformed to the world. I'm transformed by the by the Holy Spirit, and I have a renewing of the mind. We go through mind renewal every day. We wake up in the morning. Those those saints who walk in Christ, we have an everyday mind renewal. Am I am I right about it? Not just when you get baptized, you have a mind renewal. It's every day. It's every day you wake up because you wake up with Jesus stayed on your mind and you don't do what you used to do every day. You don't do what you used to do. You do what Jesus wants us to do. We show the love of Jesus everywhere we go. Anyway, that is my story. And I strongly urge you that if you don't know Jesus, come to Jesus today so that he can Remove all of your sins, give you eternal life when he comes for his bride. I know you're scratching your head saying, bride, what is he talking about? Jesus has a bride? The bride is the church. The bride is the church. And Jesus is coming for his church, his bride. For eternal matrimony with Christ Jesus. And if you have any doubts, Jesus will remove all of your doubts and he will assure you, he will assure you that you will have eternal life with him if you repent and turn to Jesus, especially in these last days that we're living in right now. If you repent and turn to Jesus, because Jesus said in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you declare that he has risen from the dead, and you confess to God the Father all your sins, you shall be saved. You shall be saved. That's a guarantee. He said he will take all of your sins and cast them to the depths of the sea. And you will remember them no more. Amen. So please don't hesitate to come to Jesus. Why don't you sit and meditate? Let his words penetrate. Listen closely to his teachings. There's no time to hesitate. Hold your head up high. In his hands you won't cry. With all our many sins, he has never said goodbye. He's the one true God. As awesome as he was, never changes, never will. I assure you, he's a rock. Amen. So come to Jesus today. And he will make a way for you when there seems to be no way. Amen? All right, all right, saints. Don't forget to subscribe, there, there, boy. Love you all. Love you all. Y'all have a blessed day, you heard, and thanks for watching.